Sziasztok! Interlinear glossing is a way for providing more insight about how languages convey information beyond just translation. Take the dedija word Magisktebsch, for example. A translation would just tell you that this means you are not writing, but the gloss would tell you exactly how Magisktebsch means that. We have ma and sh, which convey negation, the prefix ska, which is the present tense, the prefix t, which is the second person singular, and the root ktib, which means to write. So we bring all that together and get Magisktebsch. See how glossing provides information about the actual structure of the language instead of just translating? This is the use of glossing for both natural languages and conlangs. Today I'm going to cover almost everything you need to know about glossing and how the majority of linguists use it. This video was made possible by these amazing commenters under my YouTube community post who brought up what they wanted to see mentioned in the video, and also by my friend Louis who literally made up his own way of glossing because of how scary the actual conventions are. In his own words, It's interesting. Anyway, let's start. First we'll talk about the basics, then we'll talk about the symbols and abbreviations, and finish with how to properly type and format them within your document, and their limitations. So again, interlinear glossing helps show how a language conveys semantic information within its words and morphemes. Morphemes are the little bits of words like ma and ta. They're the smallest unit of linguistic information. Think of them like atoms. In the word unbelievable, you have three morphemes. Un, which means not, believe, which is just the verb, and the suffix able, which altogether means not able to be believed. The morphemes we just looked at all contain just one piece of information, but it's possible for morphemes to convey more. The final o in Spanish hablo, or I speak, conveys that the verb is in the first person singular, present tense, and indicative mood, all in one morpheme. If you still don't understand, click off this video for now and come back when you think you're more confident since it's really important to know. One more bit. Glosses are left aligned with the example word by word. I'll show you how to type them near the end of the video, but for now just keep that in mind. Morphemes are generally in small caps or capital letters and roots are in lowercase. Additionally, the language we're talking about is known as the object language, like Spanish or Dedija in our case, while the language we're using to describe the object language is known as the meta language. Anyway, there's five main symbols you need to know to be able to gloss. Let's talk about them. A hyphen is used when indicating segmentable morphemes, those that are clearly part of a word. For example, in French, the masculine form of the word for small is petit. To make it go from masculine to feminine, you add an e at the end to get petit. Final e is a little segment that we added that conveys some grammatical information, so we use a hyphen to indicate this in the gloss like so. The convention is to add this hyphen to the example sentence too, to show exactly which letters convey the additional information, but if this makes the sentence look a little weird, it's always possible to have the original unmodified sentence on the top as well. We'll go over abbreviations in a second, but this one's pretty straightforward, just femme for feminine. A period is used like in the Spanish example I gave earlier, where one morpheme conveys more than one piece of information. In the word hablo, we still use a hyphen to separate the root hablar from the segmentable morpheme o, but everything after is marked with a period since all the information is contained within the o. It's not like you're adding specific morphemes to mark the present tense and everything else like in Derija. So we gloss this as speak with the hyphen because you add o onto the word, but then all the other parts are indicated or are separated rather with periods, since all of the information is contained within the o. Again, if you recall the Derija example, each morpheme only conveyed one piece of information, which is why we used a hyphen for all of them. The underscore is similar to the period in that it indicates a situation where an unsegmentable element in the object language is represented by more than one element in the meta language. For example, the stem chuk in Turkish means come out. In that case, one word in the object language, Turkish, is represented by multiple in the meta language, English. So we gloss it as come underscore out to show that chuk is just one morpheme. You can't split chuk into different parts, even though they're technically different parts in English. Now, to make the infinitive form of Turkish verbs, you add mak to the end. How do you think we'd gloss this? Well, mak is a segmentable morpheme, since it's just one that we add to the word, so we're going to use a hyphen, like so. The equal symbol is just used for clitics. What constitutes a clitic is always a matter of debate, so I'm not going to talk about them nor propose how to define them, since it varies greatly depending on the language. It really depends on how you want to use it, combined with the general consensus of academic literature about the language you're working with. Some consider the apostrophe s in its in English, the contraction of it is, to be a clitic. So in that case, you would just gloss that word as it, and then the clitic symbol, third person singular present. I'm not here to argue about clitics in English or clitics in general, just giving an example. Angle brackets have two uses. The first is to indicate infixes, a type of affix that goes inside the word instead of at the front like a prefix or at the end like a suffix. In Tagalog, the actor focus infix is um, 
which I won't try to explain in this video since Tagalog grammar is notoriously nebulous such that bili becomes bumili. When we gloss this, you might write by and then in the angle brackets act or focus, though if you want you can leave out one of the bys. The second use is to indicate polypersonal relationships. In some languages, one morpheme conveys the relationship between both the subject and the object. In Hungarian, for example, the suffix lek in the word szeretlek, meaning I love you, conveys that the subject is the first person singular and that the object is the second person singular. It also conveys the present tense. You show this direction with the angle bracket, such that you have love with the hyphen because lek is just something you add to the root szeret, which means love, and then present tense with the period first person singular going into second person singular that shows the direction so you're going from me to you i love you not you love me if that were the case second person singular would come first and then first person singular one last note if you want to indicate circumfixes the affixes that go around a word like ma and she in dirigeon the general convention is just to have two hyphens so yeah we're done with symbols Note that there may sometimes be more like square brackets or backslashes based on the author's choices, but in those cases, if they've done their due diligence correctly, those authors should explain why they chose to use those symbols somewhere in the work. Now let's talk abbreviations. As you might have noticed in your time studying linguistics, terminology can be long. That's why we abbreviate almost everything in glosses. This is the component of glossing that can vary the most, since different authors will have different ways of abbreviating certain terms. For example, I usually abbreviate the present tense as pres, but some authors will write prs or even just pr. Like I said earlier, it's always up to the author to define their glossing terminology, so if they've done a good job, this should be clear in whatever document you're reading. Many authors will have a reason to deviate from standard abbreviations. If a category is very frequent in a language so that a shorter abbreviation is more convenient, like using f instead of fem in French since gender agreement is so common, you could choose to do that. On the other hand, if a category is very rare, like the iterative aspect, you could choose to write out the whole word to avoid confusion. If you want to use a different symbol or abbreviation and explain why your version makes more sense in the context of your work, this is absolutely okay. There's a lot of flexibility in glossing linguistics as a whole, so as long as it makes sense and you explain yourself, you can do what you think is best. A huge list of common glossing abbreviations and some other alternatives can be found on Wikipedia, so make sure to have a look on there for more information. This page also contains some of the extra symbols I mentioned some authors use, so there's a link in the description. There's some other rules I see mentioned that I don't really come across too often, so I have left them out for the sake of time and overcomplication, but if you're curious and you have a good grasp on the conventions I've described up until now, I've also put a link to the original Leipzig Conventions document that you can read in the description. I specifically left out a lot of the optional conventions under Rule 4, so you can head over there to take a look at them. Now let's talk formatting. If you're on a normal WYSIWYG text editor like Microsoft Word or Google Docs, the easiest option might be to write in all caps and then lower the font size of those letters. Remember that symbols and root words are unaffected. If you're using LaTeX, however, there's a variety of packages that make this super easy. My favorite is XPEX. Full documentation for it can be found in the description below, but I'll show you an example here anyway. You first open the environment with EX and end with XE to instantiate an example. The gloss environment starts with begin gl and ends with ngl, which makes sense. You then use gla to write the parsed object language line, glb to write the corresponding gloss, and glft for the meta language translation. You also need to add two forward slashes at the end of each line to tell LaTeX you're done writing. Then, you can add your small caps with the text sc command, and you're done. If you want, you can also, under the ex line, skip a line and write out the full segment without parsing to have both, making sure to add two backslashes after. You can also then go ahead and bold it or do whatever you want. That being said, now let's get into some of the limitations involved with glossing. Firstly, understand that glosses are not a replacement for thoroughly explaining grammatical categories and their use within a work. In Hungarian, for example, it's not enough to just gloss the ben in könyvben as inesiv because ben is not always the suffix you attach when indicating the inesiv case. Hungarian makes use of extensive vowel harmony, with vowels in many affixes change based on those in the root. Gönyvben only takes ben as a suffix because ö is a front vowel, but a word like roktar would take ban instead. Even though ben and ban are both anesthetic markers, an author would have to explain why they may vary somewhere in the work since we'd otherwise have no information about why ben changed to ban. The same applies for word order, for example. In Basque, word order determines the topic and focus of a sentence, which is often left out in glosses. In work talking about Basque, 
This should be explained somewhere, especially if it's relevant to the topic being discussed. Speaking of explaining, most authors choose the level of detail they include in a gloss, which can be confusing as a reader. As a writer, you should seek to determine the appropriate level of detail to use in your glosses. If I'm talking about prepositions in Russian, for example, it might be more useful to leave out some information about verbs and pronouns if they have nothing to do with a given preposition out of simplicity. Or I might keep that information if I want. It ultimately depends on your goals. Lastly, glossing only gives semantic information. There's so much information in typical conversations that have to do with other sources of information, such as pragmatics. In English, there's a difference if I say I didn't steal the apple versus I didn't steal the apple. There's also the issue of slang, idiomatic expressions, the implications of a sentence given context, etc. All this information can often be hard to gloss, reinforcing the idea that glossing simply provides more information, not all of it. So yeah, that's about it. Hope you enjoyed watching and you learned something new. And I guess I'll see you guys again in two weeks. Bye bye. Avisa und Lata